Good evening and welcome. Let's take a look at the top story that we are tracking for you this hour. Israel has bombed the home of the political leader of Hamas as they continue with their air raids in the Gaza Strip. Israel's military said that it targeted the homes of both Yaya Sinwar and his brother. According to the IDF, both residences served as military infrastructure for Hamas. Sinwar is a former commander of Hamas's military branch. The first elected as uh, head of Hamas's political wing in Gaza in 2017, he was re-elected in March, extending his tenure as the group's de facto leader. Fighter jets also targeted the house of Hamas commander Jabalia Battalion. The uh, footage released by the Israeli Defense Forces shows a building being destroyed by an airstrike. In a statement, the IDF said the house had served as terror infrastructure. Hamas's upper leadership has gone into hiding in Gaza. It is highly unlikely that any were at home at the time of the strikes. Meanwhile, top leader Ishmael Haniyeh is dividing his time between Turkey and Qatar, both of which provide political support to the group. Since the beginning of the conflict, Israel has been targeting crucial Hamas infrastructure. Earlier, in an overnight operation, Israel targeted a network of Hamas's tunnels under Gaza. The underground network is said to be used by Hamas to move and launch attacks on Israel. Now, political analyst Dr. Haras Cohen is joining us live from Tel Aviv for more on this. Thank you for being with us. Now, uh, amid the UN's call for an immediate end to fighting, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu has said that Israel's strikes on Hamas targets will continue with full force, effectively ruling out an end to the conflict in the coming days. Is this correct? Well, he said that, yes. But as we've also learned, there are a lot of behind-the-scenes uh, pressure, much a lot of behind-the-scenes pressure being applied on Israel to stop uh, the fighting or basically to uh, accept a ceasefire or get ready to a ceasefire. And here I'm talking about behind-the-scenes uh, U.S. and EU pressure. So I think that we have to wait um, and see how much of that rhetoric will actually manifest into action actions. Right, Doctor. Now, the Palestinian envoy at the UN has said that Jerusalem is not for sale, whereas Israel's envoy to the UN has said that Hamas is trying to undermine uh, the Palestinian president, Mahmoud Abbas, and is trying to portray itself as the sole protector of the Palestinians. What is your view and take on that? Well, I, I, I say that, very interestingly, this conflict has erupted in perfect timing for uh, quite a few actors in the area here. First of all, there is uh, President, uh, Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu that right now was about law. He, he basically, his mandate to create a government ended. And then uh, right now you had a coalition building to create a mandate to take over the government, basically to, to create a coalition that would rule. Um, and right now having this kind of a conflict uh, basically drew a split between the coalition members. And here are talking about uh, Arab parties, Arab parliament parties, and the right-wing parliament parties. And indeed, we saw that Yamina, which means uh, to the right uh, in Hebrew, uh, leaders, um, Naftali Bennett and Ayala Chaked, said that they will not uh, continue with their negotiations to create a coalition that will not join Netanyahu, that will go basically and take, take over instead of Netanyahu's government, but they have decided to join Netanyahu. So uh, this fits and, and, and just perfect timing. And also regarding Hamas, um, we have to think of how this started, um, that, that Hamas said that they launched the first missiles because of what was happening in Al-Aqsa. And I, I think it's really important to, to think about this. Um, as you said, I, I'm uh, from Tel Aviv. We have bomb shelters. Many of the houses have got individual bomb shelters. So when the government uh, is engaged in, in uh, military action that results with uh, bombs or rockets being launched, launched at the civilian population, they make sure that we have where to hide. While with Hamas, that is not the case. Not only are they taking over a fight that does not take place in their territory, so it's more of a symbolic affiliation, but their civilian population um, is basically defenseless. And I'm just wondering 
um, where does that come into play into the whole analysis? Because they know that every rocket that they launch and hits anywhere in Tel Aviv and or, or in any civilian population, a civil, civilian populated area in Israel will be responded with very severe actions against their defenseless population. So, um, yeah, I think I think this is this is um, a very, very uh, interesting I don't know, interesting is maybe perhaps the wrong word, but questionable behavior. Now, what happened that the, the reason that they did that is because that, that posits them as an alternative to the PA, the Palestinian Authority, that has basically postponed the election that it was right. about to hold. And and right now they come out to be uh, an actor and a strong player within the this geopolitical scene. But the question is, at what price to their civilian population? Not to mention that when was the last time that there were elections held in Gaza, um, democratic elections. Um, so right. all of these are very important to keep in mind when analyzing this conflict and trying to think about the forces that are in play here. Right. Right, right. And moving on to other forces that do come into this. In a joint statement, the OIC has said that it condemns in the strongest terms these attacks launched by Israel, uh, while Iran and uh, Saudi Arabia have strongly called for an end to the evacuations that are being you know, conducted and carried out in Jerusalem. How do you see the role of these two major Islamic countries in the region during this ongoing crisis? Well, I, th I think it's, it's um, I would like to veer to the United States for a second. So we are right now after the Trump presidency. And what Trump has did has done was created uh, new ge geopolitical alliances in the Middle East. So you see right now Israel has normalized relationship with the UAE, with Bahrain, and also to some level with Saudi Arabia. There were even talks of having official normalized relationships. So definitely we see a change in the way that the media coverage in these country is is right now is not um, obsessively covering the, the conflict as it was before. We see, um, as in previous years and previous conflicts, similar conflicts, so we see definitely a change. What I would have loved to see is to see uh, an attempt to de-escalate, to bring the two sides to talk, to have a ceasefire, because right now what we see is just civilians dying uselessly. this deadly flare of violence. How do you see the role of uh, United Arab Emirates, Bahrain, Sudan, Morocco, who have all moved to normalize their relations with the Jewish state of Israel? I see their role. What I would hope to see happen is that they would use the fact that they have right have a normalized relationship right now with Israel to um, get over the wall of suspicion, as you would say. Um, they are right now on speaking terms, diplomatic relationship with Israel. So intervene and try to broker some sort of an agreement because in Israel, there is a lot of suspicion towards Hamas, the way that the Israeli uh, uh, government government sees right now Hamas and the Israeli population, they see them as, as irrational actors that are evil. And this is right now, again, I'm speaking from Israel. So this is the perception. So I think if these countries that are right now perceived in Israel as new friends in the region, and there was a lot of joy and celebration of these new relationships, if they would intervene and somehow try to normalize the relationship with Hamas, it would have been uh, um, great and extremely useful in this volatile situation, and perhaps would have been very helpful in preventing future conflicts, such as we're seeing right now, future eruptions. Right. Now, there are reports uh, coming out of Israel, clashes breaking out in regions like Lod, and uh, several, several people have been arrested. Is Israel staring at a domestic security crisis at the same time as this ongoing conflict? Well, I'm, I'm not sure about that because um, while this indeed there is violence underground, we have to, I think it's really important to think about or to look at who is driving it. So um, there is a lot of illegal uh, arms uh, circulating within the Arab population and uh, Israeli Arab, Israeli Palestinian population. And the problem is that Israel did not address this problem seriously enough in the past few years. And right now, what we're seeing is that if in the past this this these arms these weapons were used to find between to fight between different families uh, or different uh, groups within the Arab population in Israel right now <clears throat> it's being targeted against 
Israelis. So this is one thing. Now, we don't really see the Arab uh, leadership in Israel uh, supporting these or heavily supporting these uh, these attacks. There, uh, we even see uh, Abbas, uh, who is the head of Ra'am, um, uh, one, of, one of the parties that was actually considering even joining Netanyahu's coalition, coming out to Lod today and saying, listen, uh, let us help us rebuild a, a synagogue that was set on fire here by local Arab youth. Um, so I think that my hope is that this will be contained and that it will not escalate. My actual concern is what will happen in if, the, if in the West Bank we're going to see big eruptions of violence? What will, what will happen if we will see uh, violence from Hezbollah in the north? That is, mm -hmm. I think that once you let the genie out of the, out of the bottle, you don't know where it's going to go. So it is indeed, again, from Israel, very scary right now to travel here between cities, especially if they go through Arab or close to Arab villages, because you don't know if there will be youth throwing stones, and there have been cases like that. Um, but at the same time, um, until two weeks ago, even a week ago, we were talking about a new era of, of relationship between the Jewish and the Arab population in Israel. So I think that we have to keep in proportion what is happening right now um, and, and see how deep the tear actually is. Dr. Hedasco, and thank you very much for your uh, analysis of the ongoing situation. We are now available in your country. Download the app now. Get all the news on the move.